so thanks, Wendy. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Eric Auger, who is a partner of Putnam uh, Associates, uh, and I think had a hand in, in commercializing and marketing, uh, or at least involved in many of the discussions of, of the Spark activities and commercialization uh, of their uh, gene therapy products. Uh, Eric is going to talk about uh, uh, his experience with economic and commercial, uh, uh, yeah, economic and commercial basis for price setting in gene therapy studies or gene therapy applications. Eric, thank you. Uh, so, thank you for having me. I'm very, very happy to be here. My name is uh, Eric Oje, um, and uh, how do I advance this? So uh, just a, a few disclosures first. So um, <clears throat> I am a commercial uh, strategy management consultant. Uh, my, my firm specializes in life sciences, and we work uh, primarily with biopharma, cell and gene therapy companies, and, and the life sciences investment community. So that's the sort of the perspective that I bring. Um, our work uh, generally is to assess commercial opportunity, um, to support commercialization planning and uh, to the topic here to support price and patient access planning. Um, and specifically, uh, you know, part of the, the reason I'm invited here today is I, I supported Spark Therapeutics and their pricing of Alexterna. Um, so um, I've been asked to provide a, uh, a perspective on the, the economic and the commercial um, challenges and considerations uh, that go into pricing of generic ther uh, uh, genetic therapies. Um, and I'll tell you, in working with, with executives in biopharma and in the, the gene therapy community, um, it is one of the most complex and difficult decisions that they make in the, the lifespan of a product. And I'm sure some of you here have had that experience and, and recognize that it's something that is wrestled with internally. Um, for quite a long time before the product is launched. Uh, it starts very early and they actually, uh, usually these decisions are not made until, uh, I'll say often the week before, <laughs> uh, or the, the last minute when you actually have to list the price. Um, there are large committees, uh, while, while the decisions are ultimately made by the senior executives in the company, there's large committees that support them that provide um, various perspectives, the patient's perspective, the investor's perspective, um, the, uh, the healthcare system's perspectives, payers' perspectives. Um, so all of these perspectives are, are, are tried to be taken into, into account in making these decisions. And, and my company's role is to sort of frame that for them, help them to work through it, uh, gather data and provide information in order to help support that decision making in, a, in a, an evidence-based way. Um, and ultimately, we don't make the decisions for them, but we help to, to sort of coach them uh, through the through the process. Um, so when we talk about uh, pricing and market access, we need to recognize that um, it's a big world. <laughs> um, these products are usually uh, intended to be launched globally at some point in their life cycles, um, and the different systems uh, across the globe have very different. Um, very different healthcare system models for which the pricing decision needs to ma be made within, within that context. Um, and this is just to present some examples of, of those systems in some of the, the larger developed markets. And these are really the markets that are the, you know, the, the primary targets for commercialization of, of these therapies, the ones that, that make the investment thesis, if you will, for, for investing in these. Um, the U.S. is really a unique model amongst this. It's, uh, it's one where you have free pricing, so uh, there is no formula, no government-mandated approach to how you set your price. You get to set the price at, at what you will on a, on a whack basis, if you will, the, the acquisition cost. Um, however, there's a very diffuse system of payers. Some are government-based, some are private-based, um, that uh, independently negotiate discounts from that price. Uh, and those discounts are, are negotiated on the basis of access. Uh, there's a determination of based on how much of a discount or how much of a rebate you might provide or what other type of concession a pharmaceutical company might provide, what type of access they might grant. Uh, and there's a balance of a negotiation there. Um, in many of the markets in Europe, it's much more health technology assessment focused. Uh, and there's different 
um, flavors of health technology assessment. Uh, the UK is really the, the poster child for very strict cost effectiveness assessment. Uh, it's very formulaic. Um, the, the assessment, of course, is very complex, and you, depending on what assumptions you build into an assessment, you can get to very different answers. But at the end of the day, they have a threshold, and if, if products don't meet, it, meet a threshold, they don't get reimbursed, they don't get covered. Um, uh, UK, Australia, Canada, those systems tend to, to follow that model. Um, other markets like Germany, France, Italy have systems that are similar in nature where they do a, a very thorough health technology assessment. Uh, but at the end of the day, what they're looking to do is to, to benchmark you against the comparator. So whatever your therapy is, um, there is typically a standard of care that it will be replacing if it's in use, uh, and that will tend to serve as the benchmark. Um, if your product is evaluated in the health technology assessment to provide a, a superior outcome on some measure that, that's relevant uh, to those therapies, then you can get a price that's a premium to those therapies. If not, then you cannot launch at a price that's, that's a premium or you cannot uh, get reimbursed at a price that's a premium. Of course, there's a lot more complexity that goes into it than that, but that's sort of a simplified view. Um, in those markets, budgets also tend to take, come into play. So, you may warrant a premium, but if they determine that the impact on the national health budget is going to be too severe, they will decrease that premium in order to, to meet the budget needs. And then there's other markets like Japan that have a, sort of a hybrid approach that is very formulaic and may include some reference, you know, uh, again, benchmarking of, of comparators may include budget impact, may also include things like international reference pricing. So. Uh, the price can be no more than the composite of three other markets not internationally um, that, uh, that are out there. So there's many common considerations across these models that will focus the discussion on the U.S., but I think as you can see, um, one of the challenges of commercializing uh, these, these types of innovations, particularly for small companies that are, that are marketing, you know, commercializing their first, is just the infrastructure that's required to deal with all this. <laughs> To be able to launch globally requires a very, very large infrastructure, and this is just one aspect. This is just market access. This isn't everything else that they need to deal with. Um, so at the end of the day, what you know, companies and executives in, in these companies are really trying to do are balance two objectives that do not necessarily align very easily. But on the one hand is viability. I need, if I'm a, if I'm a Gene therapy company executive, I need to continue to attract investment, uh, which means I need to present a pricing um, opportunity that will support a commercial opportunity ultimately to investors. I need to fund operations. So I'm not just launching this product. This product has a very big operational infrastructure that supports getting it to market. And at the same time, while I'm doing that, I need to fund my next products because this product has a limited life cycle and the revenues at some point are going to drop away very quickly, and I need to replace that cash flow. And if I'm not thinking of all three of those things, I don't have a company and I'm not bringing a therapy to market. On the other side, they need to think about accessibility. Ultimately, the, the, the human impact of these therapies is it being used in patients that are in need, um, and that is always uh, front and foremost, as Wendy mentioned, uh, the commitment of her company of hiring a chief patient officer is basically the first commercial person they've hired um, to make sure that at the end of the day they can align incentives so that they can maximize patient impact, maximize health system impact, uh, and also minimize disparities to therapy. Uh, so again, thinking about the various um, insured segments, there's patients that are uninsured, um, and then there's, um, there's various other disparities that occur across different, uh, different therapeutic areas. All of these things are, are front and foremost in the, in the evaluation set. Um, <clears throat> with gene and uh, cell and gene therapies, there are an uncommon set of commercialization challenges that you often don't see across other types of therapies. Uh, so first of all, because their genetic therapies is often a small adjustable population, this is not completely uncommon. Of course, it's common across all rare diseases, whether it's a cell and gene therapy or a traditional therapy. Uh, but what it means is that across a very small patient population, you have a very limited commercial opportunity, very commercial use opportunity in order to recoup your investment, in order to fund operations, in order to fund everything that I just mentioned on the last slide. 
Um, you also often have very difficult screening and identification criteria to actually get patients into therapy. So you're starting with a small population, and then you have a real difficult challenge in actually finding them and getting the therapy to those patients. Um, and then you have the challenge of payers potentially facing disproportionate risk because they're generic therapies, they may be familial. Um, and, so, and so you may have um, some pay payers that have no exposure, and then you have other payers that have a cluster and have a very large exposure. Um, and that becomes a challenge to those payers to finance that. And then if it's a challenge for payers to finance it, then it's a challenge for the pharma company <laughs> that's commercializing it. Um, complex delivery logistics. Um, CAR-Ts are the poster child for this, but all, all gene therapies would have the same. That requires a procedure, requires coordinating that procedure in a complex manner. Uh, oftentimes uh, with, with CAR-Ts or with others, it requires um, you know, an extraction first and then a manufacturing process and then re-administering to the patient. All of this is extremely high complexity to manage, which means that there is added cost and added risk to that process, which, which needs to be accounted for in the commercialization scheme. Um, it also, these, these factors inhibit or can inhibit broad utilization. It's much easier to just write a prescription for a pill. <laughs> much harder to organize all that for one patient to get through therapy. Um, and those things tend to be deterrence to actual use. Um, <clears throat> and then the challenge of one-time administration. The the pharmaceutical market is like any other market where you, you, you have a transaction. You get something, you pay for something, and it happens, in this case, just once. <laughs> in a chronic rare disease you know, environment, usually it's a monthly transaction. Right? You are providing prescription each month. That, that's going to be a recurrent revenue stream. Um, and you're going to have that over many years because typically they're chronic lifetime therapies. With a gene therapy, it's a one-time administration. All of the costs and all of the commercial opportunity that's going to that's going to fund your investment has to be re recouped in that one single transaction. Which means that um, a couple things, two, several things. One, there's also no opportunity for a low-risk trial. You can't say try it, see if it works, right, and come back next month. You got to make the decision: Are you doing it or are you not? Um, and if you do it, it has to be paid for right then and there <laughs> without having the chance to see if it works before the full, um, the full payment that you're going to put out for that therapy um, can be provided. Um, and then again, I talked about the, uh, the no recurrent revenue opportunity. Um, so beyond the challenges of, of simply that, the gen that they are uh, you know, gene and cell-based therapies, there's also specific challenges that have to do with the U.S. healthcare system. So first of all, there's government pricing rules. So if I want to have, say, a pay-for-performance scheme that would rebate if a patient is not successful on therapy, again, you're, they're paying all up front, right? If I want to try to take that risk away and say, well, if the patient, if it doesn't work, I test it three months from now and it didn't work, I'll, I'll rebate it. Well, if you do that, now every Medicaid patient is getting a price of zero. Um, and every patient that would be in any of the major government um, programs, like the military or, or, or VA, we'd be getting a price of zero. Um, and so you need to take that into account in, in how you commercialize and also your ability to actually provide those types of, of schemes. Siloed budgets. <clears throat> Most um, payers in the U.S. market are, have siloed budgets. They have a pharmacy side. They have a medical side. Um, and not only that, they're not integrated with government, so societal benefits aren't taken into account at all. So if I am trying to justify the price of my gene therapy, um, the only one that's going to care is going to be the one whose budget is hit. <laughs> and all they're going to care about are the savings to their budget. Any savings anywhere else in the system, any benefits anywhere else in the system, they are just not incentivized. They may care about it humanistically, but for their job, they're not incentivized to care about it. Um, and then lastly, insurance portability, and I highlighted this one because to me this is the biggest single challenge of, of gene and uh, cell-based therapies. Uh, it comes back to um, the one-time payment model. You're asking someone to pay once right up front for a lifetime benefit. Payers in this country have a patient in their system on average for less than three years. And they say, 
why am I going to pay for the lifetime benefit when this patient is going to be in someone else's plan paying a premium to that other plan three years from now? Uh, and r so far, I haven't seen any proposals that, in, that actually address that in a sufficient manner. Um, I've seen many that are slight workarounds <laughs> that might help, but nothing that addresses that fundamental issue. Um, so maybe, again, this is supposed to be about the economic and commercial basis. So, um, you know, one of the key, um, you know, organizations that has a, you know, a, a voice in this, in this, uh, this decision making is an organization called ICER. Uh, it's the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. Um, again, in most European countries, there is a national body that does health technology assessment. The U.S. does not have that, but we have ICER, which is a, a nonprofit organization, independent organization that has taken up that role. And basically what they do is they, when new innovations come to market, they uh, convene a panel of experts. Uh, they, first of all, they do a very thorough um, expert evaluation. They then they convene a panel of independent experts um, that play the role of, of an HTA body and um, have a, a, a very thorough deliberation as well as then vote on the, uh, the merits of, of, the, um, of the therapy. Um, and they're, they've developed this framework which is you know, organized to determine and to assess the long-term value for money of the new intervention and it has four elements that go into it. The uh, comparative clinical effectiveness, that's basically, you know, from an outcomes basis, what does this therapy do and do differently relative to the standard of care that it would replace? Um, incremental cost effectiveness, again, this is really the foundational piece for systems like the UK, uh, but where they will calculate a, a ratio of the cost per quality, a quality adjusted life year that this therapy provides and that gives a common, systemic quantitative metric that you can compare therapies against therapies for the value that they provide. Again, assuming that you can align on the assumptions that go into those assessments. Um, and then they have two other pieces that are taken into account that are much less quantitative in nature, uh, other benefits and disadvantages. So this is um, things like, does this uh, provide value not just to the patient but to caregivers that you know, does allow caregivers to go back to work? Um, does it, um, you know, allow for a significant you know, the enhanced quality of life that might not come into a cost effectiveness evaluation? Um, does it allow a patient uh, to, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to develop in other ways that aren't necessarily related to that therapy and that disease? Um, and then contextual considerations. Um, is this a first of its mechanism of action? Is it a disease that has nothing else for it? Um, it you know, does it give hope, uh, as Wendy mentioned? Um, so other factors that are much less quantitative, but also should be taken into account. So that's their, their approach. Um, if we look at just recent examples in the cell and gene therapy landscape, this was the evaluation, ICE's evaluation of Luxterna, and I've, I've greatly simplified it here so I can get it on one slide to show here, but this is the essence of it. Um, <clears throat> again, they, they go against the four parameters and then at the end of the day, they take a vote on its long-term value for money. On the four parameters uh, is the is, you know, first comparative clinical effectiveness, is the net health benefit greater than supportive care? Uh, the panel voted um, 12 to zero on, on a yes vote on that. Incremental cost effectiveness. The range that ICER calculated was a range of 135,000 per quality to 644,000 per quality. The reason for the wide range, there's two variables that go into it. One is um, the age of the patient. It's much more cost effective in, if, you, if you dose a three-year-old than if you dose a 30-year-old. Um, so the age of the patient is, um, is, is a factor. Uh, and then secondly, the other piece of the range is whether or not they took into account societal benefits beyond the benefits simply to the, to the, to the medical system. Uh, so in other words, not just taking into account other cost offsets to the medical system, but also um, does it improve their productivity at work, um, uh, things like that. Um, now that range in the U.S., again, uh, depending on the market, different markets have different sensibilities as to what's justifiable. In the U.S. market, a range of 100 to 150 per quality has generally been 
what has been considered acceptable. Um, and then there's great debate as to whether that range should be uniform or whether a rare disease therapy should have a higher range because, uh, again, when you have fewer patients to make back your, your commercial investment on, um, it's, it's often very, almost nearly impossible for, for orphan disease therapies to be in that 100 to 150 uh, K per quality range. So there's a lot of debate first on the assumptions that go into this assessment. I, I guarantee you Spark would argue that those costs for quality should be lower if, if they use the assumptions that they would propose. Um, and on the other hand, there's also debate as to what's the right, right range that is, that is acceptable. Um, the other benefits, the panel saw uh, a number of other benefits that were noted, so like caregiver productivity, ability to work, a novel mechanism of action, uh, the potential developmental impact to the patients uh, in, in the long term, as well as um, many uh, contextual considerations that were noted, the long-term impact on quality of life and, and the long-term burden of, of, you know, extreme burden of the illness, um, and as well as the uncertainty for the durability of the therapy. Um, again, they're making a decision when this therapy has only been studied out to about four years. Um, right, so it's durable to four years, but there is no hard evidence as to whether it's durable to six years, uh, or ten years, or twenty years. Uh, and that single element is critical to that incremental cost-effectiveness <laughs> analysis. You get a very different result if you assume a lifetime uh, therapeutic benefit than if you assume a three-year or four-year therapeutic benefit. At the end of the day, um, taking all that into account, uh, the majority of the panel you know, rated this an intermediate um, long-term value for money, uh, which you know, is to say, I, you know, I would say, based on the, the commentary of the panel, um, it was you know, recommended for use at, at this price um, based on the assessment that it presents a, a reasonable, um, you know, a reasonable uh, value. Um, <clears throat> I'm much less familiar with, with the CAR-Ts. Um, I'm familiar with them. I haven't studied them as in-depth. Uh, but just to give a, a sense of what their assessment was as well, I've, I've, uh, again, there's, there's two CAR-Ts right, that have come to market in, in short order, um, and ICER evaluated them together, uh, again, for two different indications, one uh, you know, uh, a much smaller indication and one a much larger indication. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, Again, it all depends on your assumptions, but based on the assumptions that ICER deliberated and ended up using, um, their cost per qualities came into pretty reasonable ranges for, uh, I, know, I know those prices are high, and I know they're, the sticker shock of a price of a CAR-T is extremely high, but when you look at it on a, um, you know, a cost for what you get perspective, um, relative to the norms of healthcare systems, not just in the U.S., but globally, um, the cost per qualities came in at pretty reasonable, um, pretty reasonable levels. So um, just to give a perspective of, you know, when a pharma company or a, a cell and gene therapy company is thinking about how to price their drug, how do they go about it? Uh, and I've I've really reduced this in great <laughs> in simplicity quite a bit uh, to get it on one page, but there are a number of factors they need to consider, and really what we sort of walk them through in, in great detail is a very thorough stakeholder evaluation. When they think about pricing their drug, it's not just impacting them, it's impacting a wide range of stakeholders, uh, and there is no way, there is no way to satisfy all, all stakeholders the way that they would like to be satisfied. However, they need to take every perspective into account and do the best they can to balance the needs of those stakeholders in their decision. Uh, the stakeholders include patients, and their considerations are obviously accessibility, as well as out-of-pocket out costs to not bankrupt them. Um, healthcare practitioners, um, again, they often have the lens of patient access. They want to be able to treat the patient that's right in front of them. Um, and they don't want to have to tell them that they can't treat them with the, the latest and uh, most uh, you know, appropriate therapy for them. Um, and they also need to think about their practice economics. Can I afford to actually deliver this therapy? Can I handle the carrying costs of this therapy when I have to stock it before I deliver it? Um, can, I, can I put out $850,000 <laughs> up front before I know that I'm actually going to get reimbursed by a, by a, a, um, a payer? 
payers need to think about value, just as we just walked through with the ICER models. They need, but, but more importantly, again, a lot of those elements of value that you see in an ICER report actually aren't, aren't pertinent to a payer in the U.S. because they're, they're costs and savings that don't hit that payer. They're thinking about it from a much narrower perspective. Uh, and so, you know, two things that they greatly value are the budget impact. They typically work in, you know, yearly and quarterly cycles, and if I miss my budget next quarter, my job's at risk. Um, so they're thinking about that budget impact. They're also thinking about predictability. I want to know what's going to cost me. I don't want to be surprised next quarter that 10 patients I wasn't expecting ended up on this therapy. Channel players. Um, these are, you know, it can be a distri it can be specialty distributors that actually get the product from manufacturer to um, to the institution that's going to administer it. It's um, intermediaries that support the transaction that may help to alleviate some of that carrying cost risk for the, the institution. Um, again, there it's a this is a little bit again. M many people here probably don't know much about this because it's not a very transparent um, piece of the system, but it's a very important piece of the system and pharmaceutical companies and, and cell and gene therapy companies need to think about how do I actually get this to the patient and what's that going to cost me because it's not free. It requires th these people need to make their cut. They need to, to make a profit or else they're not in business as well. Um, KOLs. Um, so again, in order for this, these therapies to be taken up, they need champions. They need medical champions and you need to make sure that the medical champions are aligned. Um, and, uh, and willing to advocate. Um, and what's meaningful to KOLs? First of all, their reputation. They don't want to support a product all the way to market than to be shocked by the price um, and, and have, to, have to defend that. Um, equity, they want to make sure that it's fair. Um, and they want to, they, you know, they're, they're invested in continued innovation as well. They want to make sure that the price ultimately supports innovation. Um, policymakers. Um, increasingly important stakeholders <laughs> in this conversation. Um, and what they're looking at is societal value. They're the only ones that really are taking in that societal value perspective. Um, they are interested also in making sure that the healthcare system is sustainable. Um, and they're interested also to make sure that the industry is fostered and, and sustainable. So they have a pretty big balancing act. Um, and then finally, shareholders. Ultimately, none of this happens if there are, if there are no shareholders. Um, and while um, we you know, would much rather just focus on making this available to patients, we do need to factor in that it has to be at, um, at a price that incents shareholders to continue to invest. If the investment dries up, the these therapies do not come to market. Um, <clears throat> so finally, um, you know, these um, therapies, uh, it's not just about the price, um, right? Price is one element in access, um, but it's, it's, it's really about how do we come together and find ways to make these accessible, recognizing that these need to be commercially viable, um, and we need to balance that with making sure that patients have the maximum accessibility possible. Um, and so, um, while none of these, um, these uh, efforts that, that Spark has taken in this regard are perfect because they're all done within the constraints of our system, um, they are first steps and they're you know, sort of you know, knocking on the door of what we need, <laughs> um, which, which are things like their innovati innovative contracting model. Um, what that is, is is a mechanism to sort of de-risk the carrying of the product for the institution. Um, so that the institutions are not, uh, you know, do not do not have that risk. Um, the outcomes-based rebate model. So if the product does not ultimately work, um, there is a rebate in play to payers uh, to 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 support that, to, to refund for that. Um, and then they have ongoing um, discussions with CMS for a pretty novel um, model that would take down some of the the government pricing barriers. That would that really restrict to the level to which they can do performance-based and annuity-based models. So stretching out the payments over years, these are very challenging right now. What they're trying to do with CMS is break down some of those barriers in a demonstration project, and if that's successful, that can that could potentially lead to a model for this industry to follow in the future. Um, so um, just to, to close, um, 
ultimately, you know, cell and gene therapies present obviously uh, enormous human benefit opportunity, and everyone here wants to make sure that um, that those opportunities are realized. Um, but they also face very substantial uphill challenges. Um, first, to, you know, to patient access and afford affordability, but also to sustaining the investment that's required to bring these to market. Um, and pricing and access decisions should acknowledge both of those challenges. The, the, the innovators and the manufacturers that bring them to market need to, to make sure that they set prices in a responsible manner, that they think through these issues, and that they balance the stakeholders' perspectives and needs. Um, however, all stakeholders need to also participate in coming to the table with, with the solutions. It's not just about the price. It's also about the mechanisms for access and the way that our, that our country actually funds health care. Um, that is, um, you know, part of the problem of, of, of why these therapies are so hard to commercialize. Um, so ultimately, it comes down to shared accountability. Um, I think we, you know, need to all take a, a role in trying to, to come to solutions. So, okay. Happy to take questions. Um, any burning questions? I think you're as far as possible from the microphone. <laughs> Excuse me. So I wonder if it would be feasible for uh, to chip away at least some of these problems by having a payer, for example, say to a patient, we will cover the cost of your gene therapy under the condition that you will also become our lifeline, lifetime subscriber. In other words, you will continue to be our customer. You don't get to go to somebody else. Or you could if you want. You're still going to owe us our monthly premium as well. I wonder if that would work. That's uh, a great question. Um, and idealistically, <laughs> that would be a, a nice solution. I think that one of the problems is that most patients don't have control over their payer. Uh, or, no, no, it would be the payer telling the patient um, the, well, that's what I mean. So, so as a as a patient, right? Typically, um, I'm getting health insurance in one of several mechanisms. One, you know, one most most often is it's employer based, right? Mm -hmm. So, I often don't even have a choice in who my payer is. It's based on where I work and what what payer that you know the the system that they have. Yeah. And if I change jobs, that's going to change. I see. Right. Um, and then same thing with, um, you know, for those that do not have employer base, it's often, you know, you're either in Medicaid, uh, Medicaid plans, if, or you're in Medicare. If you're in a Medicare plan, those plans, if, if you've seen in the news <laughs> every year, plans go in, go out of the system, right? So even if you had that, you probably wouldn't get more than 10% to be able to actually align to that. That's sort of the challenge. Okay. <laughs> we'll see you back in a few minutes. Okay. Okay, good morning everybody. So first of all, there actually are maybe, I don't know, about 20, 25 seats at the very, very front. They're a little bit uh, blocked from behind, but we can fit those people in easily. So feel invited to get a little cozy because that's the only way we're going to solve all these problems, get cozy. Um, I realize we did not introduce ourselves. Uh, Ted Friedman is the chair of the Ethics Committee, and I'm Rachel Salzman. I'm the chair of the Government Relations Committee. And I think of all the committees at ASGCT, we could have paired up any two committees to talk about this because at the end of the day, like we said, if we can't get this to patients in a way that's going to be sustainable and accessible, there's sort of no reason to wake up and go to work in the morning. So I think it was really um, visionary of the leadership to combine our two committees to bring this together because there is an element of ethics that really you need to take a step back and think what are our values um, as individuals and as members of society and as professionals. And then we also have to think we do live within a system where we have to think about policies um, I don't, Wendy, I don't know if she broke it down, but um, anywhere between probably a third and a half of our customers are going to be on either Medicaid or Medicare. So government is going to play a huge role in terms of making some of these things um, become actual. 